we're gonna have to slap the dirty little Jap. And Uncle Sam's the guy who can do it. We'll skin that streak of yellow from the sneaky little fella. And he'll think a cyclone struck him when we're through it. We'll take that double crosser to the old woodshed. We'll start right on his bottom and we'll go to his head. When we get done with him, he'll wish that he was dead. We've got to slap a dirty little Jap. Uncle Sam's a man who's given a helping hand to many a foreign land. Don't forget it. But when somebody goes to tromping on his toes, they'd better guard their nose or they'll regret it. We're going to have to slap the dirty little Jap. And Uncle Sam's a guy who can do it. The Japs and all their hooey will be changed into chop suey And the rising sun will set when we get through it Their alibi for fighting is to save their face For ancestors waiting in celestial space We'll kick their precious face down to the other place We gotta slap the dirty little Jap We're gonna have to slap the dirty little Jap, and Uncle Sam's the guy who can do it. I wouldn't fool you, mister, he can raise an awful blister, and somebody's pants will burn before we're through it. We'll reach across the ocean and grab that yellow Jap, and turn him upside down right on democracy's lap. We'll blister his axis and do it with a snap. We gotta slap the dirty little Jap. Uncle Sam is mild, as peaceful as a child, but never get him riled or you will rue it. So now they want to fight. Well, they bit off quite a bite, and Uncle Sam is going to make them chew it. We're going to have to slap the dirty little Jap, and Uncle Sam's the guy who can do it. Cause it really is a feature when he starts to be a teacher. We can show you several pupils who've been through it. Uncle Sam believes in the golden rule, but when he's double-crossed, he's got a kick like a mule. We're warning Hitler's too, but Sam's a fighting fool. We gotta slap the dirty little Jap. Last time, we critiqued the Good War myth and how and why such a myth has been sustained, particularly in the USA, arguably the only true victor of that war. In this lecture, we will look at the racial aspects of America's Good War, particularly at how it racialized the Japanese enemy, and how it marginalized and discriminated against its own African American servicemen through the use of particular racial stereotypes. We will also see how Hollywood reacted to proposed representation of, Af of African Americans in the Second World War. Now remember, the US were not only fighting against the Japanese, even though the Americans had been attacked by Japanese armed for forces. Shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Japan's allies, namely Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy, declared war on America as well. Indeed. The circumstances for a world war had been created by the European Axis powers. But the real villains for American propaganda were the Japanese. It's evident that the Japanese were easy antagonists for American propagandists because of the unprovoked attack on Pearl Harbor. Their treachery was self-evident, yet the Germans with their aggressive foreign policy had engaged in treacherous acts of their own, catapulting the world towards a devastating conflict. However, according to American propagandists, the German people were not atrocious. Rather, they had been corrupted by Hitler. On the other hand, as we have seen with Capra's Know Your Enemy Japan, the Japanese people were depicted as inherently evil. In addition, American propaganda was very careful to distinguish between Nazi crimes and the behavior of good Germans. But the, brut the brutality perpetrated in the Pacific was broad stroked as being simply Japanese. The yellow peril or the yellow fear is a racist color metaphor that represents East Asian peoples as an existential danger to the Western world. 
Fear of the other peril is racial, not national. It's fear resulting not from concern with a specific source of danger or from any one people or country, but from a vaguely ominous existential fear of the faceless nameless hordes of Yolo people in the Asia Pacific region. The racist ideology of the Yolo peril derives from a core imagery of apes, lesser men, primitives, children, madmen and beings who possess special powers. This kind of ideology developed during the 19th century as Western imperialist expansion presented Asians as the Yolo peril. In the late 19th century, the Russian sociologist Jacques Novikov coined the term in the essay Le Préel Jean or The Yellow Peril of 1897, which the German Kaiser Wilhelm II used to encourage the European empires to invade, conquer and colonize China. To that end, using the Yellow Peril ideology, Wilhelm II portrayed Japan's victory in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 as an Asian racial threat to white Western Europe, and also fabricated an alliance between China and Japan who were, as he argued, hellbent to conquer, subjugate and enslave the Western world. Before then, Japan had not been considered to be part of the Yellow Peril. The Yellow Peril racialism of the Austrian philosopher Christian von Ehrenfels proposed that the Western and the Eastern worlds were in a Darwinian racial struggle for domination of the planet, which the Yellow race was winning. However, von Ehrenfels was quick to claim that the Chinese were an inferior race of people whose Oriental culture lacked all potentialities, determination, initiative, productivity, invention and organizational talent, which was supposedly characteristic of the white cultures of the West. But despite dehumanizing the Chinese as an essentialist stereotype of physically indolent and mindless Asians, von Ehrenfels praised Japan as a first-rate imperial military power whose inevitable conquest of China would produce superior breeds of Chinese people. He argued that Japanese selective breeding with genetically superior Chinese women would produce a race of healthy, sly, cunning Asians. According to von Ehrenfels and his brand of racism, Asian conquest of the West would mean the annihilation of the white race. Continental Europe would be conquered by a genetically superior Sino-Japanese army through a race war that the Western world would not be able to win. In 1909, American author Homer V published The Valor of Ignorance, which examined American defense and in part prophesied a war between America and Japan. The book contained maps of a hypothetical Japanese invasion of California and the Philippines which intrigued American military officers, particularly those stationed in the Philippine Islands. Indeed, General Douglas MacArthur and his staff, for example, paid close attention to the book in planning the defense of the Philippines. The Japanese military also paid close attention to the book, which was translated into Japanese. Lee warned that either the Japanese would have to be virtually wiped out or they would, according to him, become the samurai of the human race and the remainder of man shall toil and trade for them and their greatness. The book sold over 84,000 copies in its first three months after publication. In the months following the attack on Pearl Harbor, Lee enjoyed a revival in the United States when his vision of Japanese supermen suddenly seemed prophetic. In 1942, The Valor of Ignorance was reprinted, but, as John Dower notes, Lee's work was largely forgot forgotten since the early 1920s because, had it been in the mainstream still in the late 1930s, the condescending racism referring to the Japanese as little men that was prevalent at that time would not have enjoyed as much airtime. Lee's so called prophecy was not seen as a specific threat from the Orient but rather as a vague premonition of future peril. In 1913, British novelist Saxon Roma published the first of 14 novels featuring the fictional evil genius of Dr. Fu Manchu. The image of Orientals invading Western nations became the foundation of Roma's commercial success and he was able to sell 20 million copies in his lifetime. Although Manchu was Chinese, 
He could summon hordes of any Asian group at any given moment. He was more brilliant than any Westerner who went against him, for not only had he mastered the languages and sciences of the West, but he also commanded the secrets of the Orient. Through Manchu, Walmer managed to draw together three basic elements that was inherent of the Yellow Fear ideology, namely Asian mastery of Western knowledge and technique, access to mysterious powers, and mobilization of the Yellow Horde, shadowy in one episode which they are described by Roma as looking like great apes. Whether it was China or Japan, this was the essence of the Yellow Peril. However, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Roosevelt administration formally declared China an ally of the US and the news media adapted their use of Yellow Peril ideology so that China be included as part of the West, criticizing contemporary anti-Chinese laws as counterproductive to the war effort against Imperial Japan. The wartime zeitgeist and the geopolitics of the US government presumed the defeat of the Imperial Japanese would be followed by post-war China developing into a capitalist economy under the leadership of the Christian Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang, or the Chinese Nationalist Party. As part of the newfound alliance with the US, Chiang Kai-shek requested that American anti-Chinese laws be repealed as a symbolic gesture of American solidarity with the people of China. Even prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor, accounts of atrocities in China roused considerable hostility for Japan. This stemmed from as early as the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931, when accounts were received of Japanese forces bombing civilian populations or firing upon survivors. Books such as Pearl Buck's The Good Earth and Frida Atti's China at War aroused sympathy for the Chinese. As early as 1937, Roosevelt condemned the Japanese for their aggression in China. Thus, even before Pearl Harbor, the American public viewed the Japanese with a particular discontent. Indeed, US propaganda presented Japan as a foreign, even alien, grotesque and uncivilized enemy more than any other Axis power. They portrayed the Japanese as blindly fanatic and ruthless, with a history of desiring overseas conquests, drawing on a misinterpretation of the samurai traditions as proof. Japanese propaganda called for the Japanese people to become 100 million hearts beating as one, which the Allied propagandists used to portray the Japanese as a mindless, unified mass. Atrocities were ascribed to the Japanese people as a whole. Even Japanese Americans would be stereotyped as supporters of Japan, who only awaited the signal to commit sabotage. Japanese atrocities and the fanatical refusal to surrender supported the portrayal of otherwise racist elements in propaganda. The Japanese were usually depicted as having a yellow skin color, a common stereotype assigned to all people of Asian descent. Slanted eyes, another common Asian stereotype, exaggerated back teeth, and monkey-like faces depicted the Japanese as animalistic monsters. But this was problematic, as these characteristics were perceived to be inherent in both Japanese enemy as well as the Chinese allies. Following Pearl Harbor, Chinese Americans were attacked by white Americans because they were mistakenly believed to be of Japanese descent. In fact, it became such a problem that Life magazine had to publish an article on the 22nd of December 1941 titled How to Tell Japs from the Chinese. In the article, the magazine attempted to describe defining physical features that set the Chinese apart from the Japanese. According to the magazine, US citizens have been demonstrating a distressing ignorance on the delicate question of how to tell a Chinese from a Jap. It claimed that Chinese consulates prepared to provide their citizens who were in the US with identification buttons so that the public could distinguish them from the Japanese in that way. The magazine then took it upon itself to educate its readers on the subtle phenotypical differences between the Chinese and the Japanese, claiming that life here adduces a rule of thumb 
from the anthropometric conform conformations that distinguish friendly Chinese from enemy alien Japs. Now, the term Jap, an abbreviation of Japanese, was commonly used in newspaper headlines to refer to the Japanese and Imperial Japan. Similarly, Nip, short for Nippon, which was the Japanese word for Japan, is also a derogatory sir. Paul Fusel explains that the usefulness of the word during the war for creating effective propaganda by saying that Japs was a brisk monosyllable handy for slogans like Wrap the Jap or Let's Blast the Jap Queen of the Map. American popular songs at the time included We're Gonna Have to Slap the Dirty Little Jap which was played right at the beginning of this video as well as We'll Slap the Japs and You're a Sap Mr. Jap. The United States Marine Corps tried to combine the word Japs with apes to create a new description, Japes, for the Japanese, but this never became popular. Propaganda based on the attack on Pearl Harbor was used with considerable effect because its outcome was so crippling and devastating that it was impossible to effectively retaliate against it. Initial reports termed it a sneak attack and infamous behavior. Throughout the war, the phrase, remember Pearl Harbor, became a rallying cry for recruitment drives. Reports of the maltreatment of American prisoners of war also aroused fury, as did reports of atrocities against native populations, such as babies being thrown into the air to be bayoneted, well, which received particular attention. On the 18th of April 1942, the US launched a long-range bombing raid against the Japanese cities of Tokyo, Yokohama, Yokosuka, Nagoya, Kobe, and Osaka in retaliation for Pearl Harbor. The raid was led by Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle, and thus the attack became known as the Doolittle Raid. The purpose of the raid was not so much a tactical one, but rather a mission to boost American morale. However, the mission was risky, as bombers were to land in China following the mission. But parts of China were occupied by the Japanese army. When three of the Doolittle Raiders were executed, it evoked a passion for revenge in America and the image of the Japanese ape became common in film and cartoons. The film The Purple Heart of 1944 dramatized their story, with one of the airmen giving a concluding speech that he now knew that he had understood the Japanese less than he had thought and that they did not understand Americans if they thought torture and execution would frighten them. Propagandists typified the Jap enemy along the following tropes. They were treacherous, fanatical, murderous, rapacious, subhuman and superhuman. These traits differed according to what message the propagandists wished to convey. Now let us go through each of these characteristics using examples to explain each. This poster was done for the US Navy by McClellan Barkley, who was commissioned as a lieutenant in the Naval Reserve in 1938 and went into active duty following the attack on Pearl Harbor. The poster depicts an American sailor being stabbed in the back by a samurai sword with a Japanese flag perched on the hilt. Unsurprisingly, the US Navy portrayed the attack on Pearl Harbor as an act of treachery. In addition, the American public were all too willing to believe that the attack was unprovoked, even though the US had effectively declared an economic war against Japan by ceasing oil exports to Japan in response to the Japanese invasion of French Indochina in 1940. The Japanese intended the attack as a preventive action to keep the US Pacific fleet from interfering with its planned military actions in Southeast Asia, particularly the oil-rich Dutch East Indies. Throughout the war, Avenge December the 7th was a popular rallying, rallying cry for the American war effort and reflected in posters, pamphlets and propaganda film. Even as the tide of the war turned against the Japanese, American propagandists saw fit to continue perpetuating the, enemy, the, the image of the Japanese war machine as virtually invincible. In 
The Japanese calls for devotion to death were used by the Americans to present a war of extermination as the only possibility, without any question as to whether it was desirable or not. In one instance, according to Dawa, one marine unit was told, Every Japanese has been told that it is his duty to die for the emperor. It's your duty to see that he does so. The suicides of women, children and the elderly, as well as soldiers at Saipan and Okinawa, only reinforced that belief. For example, in July 1944, American troops in Saipan witnessed a Banzai charge where nearly 4,000 Japanese soldiers charged American troops and fought to their death. Another example was on Okinawa where nearly one-third of the island population died. A thorough defeat of the Japanese was argued for in magazines so as to prevent a resurgence of Japanese military power or ambition. This encouraged American forces to attack civilians on the belief that they would not surrender, which again fed into Japanese propaganda about American atrocities. The brutal treatment of POWs by the Japanese was exploited by American propagandists. Posters such as these ones were called the Jap Way, recalling the executions of the three Doolittle Raiders as well as the so-called Bataan Death March in April 1942. The Bataan Death March refers to the forcible transfer of about 76,000 American and Filipino prisoners of war over a distance of around 130 kilometers after they were captured at the Battle of the Bataan Peninsula in the Philippines. General George C. Marshall, Chief of Staff of the Army, made the following statement about the march. These brutal reprisals upon helpless victims evidence the shallow advance from savagery which the Japanese people have made. We serve notice upon the Japanese military and political leaders as well as the Japanese people that the future of the Japanese race itself depends entirely and irrevocably upon their capacity to progress beyond their aboriginal barbaric instincts. The sexual fears underlying Yellow Peril discourse is revealed in this 1942 poster of a Japanese soldier carrying off a naked white woman. The image of the Japanese being a rapacious threat to American women was also a common theme. The idea that they were qualitatively different to Americans, savages of a retrograde alien civilization, was explicit and helped to play on the fears that Americans had of Japanese domination. The notion that Japanese were subhuman supported the impression that they would seize on any weakness and had to be exterminated. They were seen as not open to negotiation or persuasion in a way that an American could understand. The Japanese turned out to be a uniquely tenacious enemy, and as the war went on, and this became clearer, this kind of tenacity found its way into propaganda. But this type of resolve was portrayed as a savagely fanatical trait, one that, need to be, one that needed to be routed out. And the only way to do so was to exterminate the enemy. As hostilities progressed, Japanese soldiers and civilians became more evil and ape, snake or rat-like, inhuman, animal and utterly alien enemies hell-bent on world domination. This kind of characterization resonates with German characterizations of Jews as rats and later the Rwandan Hutus calling the Tutsis cockroaches. Both of these terms were used prior to and during genocide. After the Japanese scored stunning early victories in Southeast Asia, Homer Lee's image of the superiority of Japanese rose out of obscurity again and reignited the fear that Japanese soldiers possessed superhuman fighting ability due to their strict dedication to discipline and military prowess. This image served to substantiate the belief that the Japanese were a formidable foe who deserved no mercy and had to be exterminated if the US were to triumph. This sort of perverted respect for the enemy was not born out of genuine respect for their fighting ability as humans, but rather that their inhuman characteristics gave them the advantage over their opponents. <laughs>
Now, it must be remembered that the Americans were not alone in their racist attitudes towards the enemy in the Pacific War. The Japanese believed themselves that they were racially superior, part of the chosen Yamato race, and all non-Japanese were outsiders and inferior. They saw themselves as having a manifest destiny to be the so-called leading race or master race of Asia. The Japanese concept of Haku Ichu, eight crown cords under one roof or all of the world under one roof, dictated that meaning that the Empire of Japan had the divine right to unify the world under its banner. This imperialist slogan formed the basis of the Japanese Empire's ideology. The Japanese proclaimed themselves to be the head of the family of peoples gathered under their leadership. If persuasion did not work, force might be necessary to bring the unruly people such as the Chinese and Koreans into the fold. Unfortunately, as this lecture focuses on racial attitudes in America during World War II, we do not have enough time to go into detail about Japanese propaganda and ideology. However, I want you to be aware that antagonistic attitudes towards the enemy in the Pacific theater were not unique to the US. The Japanese had their own ideas of superior race ideology that they tried to sell to the people to their people to bolster support for the war effort. For those interested, I will include slides and readings on this topic. In the final half of this video, we will look at the extent that African American servicemen were marginalized by their own government during World War II, based on segregation policies that were in effect in the US at the time. We will explore the paradox where 1.2 million African Americans were sent to foreign countries to fight for democracy, but were treated as second class citizens. We will look at attempts by the US government as well as its media establishments to downplay and marginalize the role of African American soldiers. Then we will look at Hollywood's vain attempts to represent black, black soldiers in World War II films and why these attempts were largely unsuccessful. In week 5 of this course, we briefly looked at the so-called Jim Crow legislation that solidified racial segregation in American society particularly in the American South. The Jim Crow laws were a collection of state and local statutes that legalized the racial segregation. Named after the, a black minstrel show character and lasting for a century until 1965, the laws were meant to marginalize African Americans by denying them the right to vote, hold jobs, get an education, or other opportunities. Those who attempted to defy Jim Crow laws were often arrested or were fined with jail sentences and were threatened with violence and even death. Despite the eagerness of African American men to fight in World War II, the same Jim Crow discrimination in society was practiced in every branch of the armed forces as well. Many of the bases and training facilities were located in the South. However, Regardless of whether it was in the north or south, all bases had separate blood banks, hospitals, wards, medical staff, barracks and recreational facilities for black soldiers. Historian Matthew Delmont notes that the experience was very dispiriting for a lot of black soldiers. The kind of treatment they received by white officers in army bases in the United States was horrendous. They described being in slave-like conditions and being treated like animals. They were called racial epithets quite regularly and just not afforded respect either as soldiers or human beings. Indeed, even before the war reached the United States, most officials in policy-making positions believed that placing African Americans in combat and or allowing African Americans to become commissioned officers were mistakes. These thoughts were reinforced by the results of intelligence tests given to recruits enlisting in the services. The tests were supposed to measure intellectual ability, which in turn was to be a major determination of rank and assignment in the army. African Americans were found to score much lower than whites. Thus the conclusion drawn was that African Americans were of less military value than whites, 
In addition, there was a belief among the white American public that African Americans were less intelligent, albeit cheerful and willing, but naturally subservient, lacking in initiative and leadership qualities, and unable to accept responsibility. In some of the tests, African Americans were even subdivided by color and correlations drawn between test scores and skin pigmentation. Lighter skinned African Americans scored higher than darker skinned African Americans, although still not as high as white soldiers. It was concluded that the lightness of skin color automatically meant that mixing with white blood and thus higher intelligence. As a result of these tests, many psychologists concluded that intelligence was not really influenced by one's environment and that black men were inherently restricted mentally and this could not be changed through any kind of education. In October 1925, the Army War College issued a report entitled The Use of Negro Manpower in War, which was written by Major General H. E. Eli and included almost every racial stereotype and caricature to argue why African American soldiers needed to be kept in the lowest subordinate positions. It included the following comments. In the process of evolution, the American Negro has not progressed as far as other subspecies of the human family. The cranial cavity of the Negro is smaller than whites. The psychology of the Negro based on heredity De derived from mediocre African ancestors, cultivated by generations of slavery, is one from which we cannot expect to draw leadership material. In general, the Negro is jolly, docile, tractable, and lively, but with harsh or unkind treatment can become stubborn, sullen, and unruly. In physical courage, he falls well back of whites. He is most susceptible to crowd psychology. He cannot control himself in fear of danger. He is a rank coward in the dark. The report went on, the Negro officer was a failure in combat. Negro troops are efficient and dependable only so long as led by capable white officers and, the Negro office, and under Negro officers they have displayed entire inaptitude for modern battle. Their natural racial characteristics, lack of initiative and tendency to become panic stricken can only be overcome when they have confidence in their leaders. This report would have a continuing impact on military recruitment and treatment of African Americans and other minority groups in subsequent years. By 1932, the Navy had 441 black sailors of its 81,000 men, serving mostly in servant and laborer positions. This total of 441 is the lowest in American history. Also at the time, the U.S. Marine Corps continued to exclude African Americans from service but allowed their employment as civilian messengers at naval headquarters. In January 1933, the armed services began enlisting African American men as messmen, this time with the rationale that a war in the Pacific might eliminate the opportunity to enlist Asian American servants. The Navy preferred to enlist blacks from the South because of the belief that Northern blacks were more likely to be educated and independent. De facto racism was an entrenched way of life in the United States during this period. Even though the War Department directives forbade discrimination, the military branches virtually ignored them. The Army was overwhelmingly Southern in its orientation and its officers were intent on maintaining a two-category system one white and one colored. Before Pearl Harbor, African, American con African Americans constituted less than 6% of the army and had only five black officers, three of which were chaplains. There were no African American officers in the Navy until the end of World War II, as most blacks were relegated to the steward mate corps. By the start of World War II, African Americans were being admitted into the Army and Navy in segregated units. On the 25th of June 1941, President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order No. 8802, which established the Fair Employment Practices Commission and created a policy of non-discrimination in all branches of the arms, armed services. In 1942, 
After virtually being ordered by President Roosevelt, the Marine Corps began recruiting African Americans for the first time since 1798. The Marine Corps Commandant was opposed to accepting a large number of blacks in the Corps. In April 1941, he told the Navy General Board if it were a question of having a Marine Corps of 5,000 whites or 250,000 Negroes, I would rather have the whites. In 1942, the black newspaper, the Pittsburgh Courier, in response to a letter to the editor by James G. Thompson, a 26-year-old black soldier, in which he wrote, Should I sacrifice myself, my life, to live half American? launched the Double V campaign. The slogan, which stood for a victory for democracy overseas and a victory against racism in America, was pushed by black journalists and activists to rally support for equality for African Americans. The campaign highlighted the contributions that the soldiers made in the war effort and exposed the discrimination that black soldiers endured while fighting for liberties that African Americans themselves did not have. On the 5th of April 1945, four groups of African American so uh, officers, members of the 477th Bombardment Group, who were in training, stationed at Freeman Field, were arrested for entering a whites-only officers club. They were protesting an order issued by their commander banning them from the club. The black officers cited Army Regulation 210-10, which outlawed segregated clubs as their justification for protesting and entering the club. Several days later, the Freeman Field Command issued a statement to the effect that in the case of recreational facilities, it had been a long-standing policy that it is unwise to have personnel in training utilizing the same recreational facilities with those who train them. What this meant was that race was supposedly not involved as one club was for supervisors and the other one was for trainees. However, all supervisors were white and all trainees were black. A total of 101 African Americans were placed under arrest until their court martial hearing. Organizations throughout the US initiated legal action on the black officers' behalf. These efforts were successful and by mid-April, charges against the 101 black officers were dropped and the men were freed. However, they would receive a written reprimand that stained their military records until 1995, when the Air Force admitted that its former leadership had committed a grievous wrong. Many field commanders did not want black soldiers in their command. At one point, African American officers who were told to take orders from white sergeants. Even German prisoners of war were treated with more respect than African Americans in uniform. Even those African Americans who had earned college degrees were judged as not having the qualifications or aptitude for specialized training in various technical fields. Many African Americans along with other minority groups were placed in segregated units. Black troops experienced little combat in World War II, however there were notable exceptions. The 761st Black Panther Tank Battalion was placed under the command of General George Patton. Although the average lifespan of a separate tank battalion on the front lines in Europe was only 10 to 15 days, the 761st fought more than 183 consecutive days from France to Austria. They played an integral part in the rescue of American units surrounded by hostile German forces at the Battle of the Bulge in Belgium. The unit was later nominated for the Presidential Unit Citation on six different occasions and finally received the award in 1978. Similarly, the so-called Tuskegee Airmen of the All Black 332nd Fighter Group also engaged in combat in Europe. They were trained in Tuskegee in the southern state of Alabama. These men were the first African American aviators in the US Armed Forces. The War Department tradition and policy mandated the segregation of African Americans into separate military units staffed by white officers, but when the appropriation of funds for aviation training created opportunities for pilot cadets, their numbers reduced the rosters of older African American combat units. In 1941, the War Department and the Army Air Corps 
and the pressure of uh, under pressure constituted the first all-black flying unit, the 99th Pursuit Squadron, known as the Red Tails, because of their red tail wings. Due to the restrictive nature of selective policies, of selection policies, the situation did not seem promising for African Americans, since the 1940 U.S. Census Bureau reported that there were only 124 African American pilots in the country. But the exclusionary policies ultimately failed when the Air Corps received a large amount of applications from African American men who qualified even under the restrictive requirements. Contrary to negative predictions from some quarters, Tuskegee Airmen were some of the best pilots in the US Army Air Forces due to a combination of pre-war experience and the strict training they had to undergo. Nevertheless, the Tuskegee Airmen contained, continued to experience racial discrimination. Their impressive combat record did much to dispel criticisms aimed at them, but incidents of racism against the unit still persisted. However, after segregation in the US military was ended in 1948 by President Harry S. Truman with Executive Order 9981, the veteran Tuskegee Airmen now found themselves in high demand throughout the newly formed United States Air Force. On 11 May 1949, Air Force Letter 35.3 was published, which mandated that black airmen be screened for reassignment to formerly all-white units according to qualifications. Despite the accomplishments of units such as the Black Panthers and the Tuskegee Airmen, Hollywood was reluctant to depict African American soldiers who fought during the Second World War. During and immediately after the Second World War, the prevailing overt racism of the time blocked these kinds of stories from being told. No producer was willing to fund production of a film if it did not speak to white audiences. Apart from the US propaganda film Wings of Man of 1945, narrated by Ronald Reagan and produced with the aim of recruiting more African American pilots, depictions of African American servicemen in Hollywood films were largely frowned upon. Indeed, this attitude in Hollywood has not changed significantly since the 1940s. Cade Lee notes that movie producers are often reluctant to back epic tales with African Americans as leading characters because of a fear that white audiences will largely avoid them. The reverse effect does not seem to be as much of a concern. In 2012, the film Red Tails, a big budget dramatization of the missions carried out by the Tuskegee Airmen in Italy. The movie was directed by African American Anthony Hemingway and was produced by George Lucas, famous filmmaker responsible for the Star Wars and Indiana Jones franchises. Despite having big name Hollywood stars such as Terence Howard and Cuba Gooding Jr., Lucas was forced to finance the production of the film as well as its distribution himself, which amounted to a staggering cost of 58 million US dollars. This is because, as New York Times film critic Stephen Holden points out, the major studios didn't want to touch the film because of the box office limitations of its mostly African American cast. Lucas was dedicated to telling a story about the, about the Tuskegee Airmen ever since he first heard about them in 1988. He wanted to make a tribute to those African American servicemen who experienced racial discrimination against them in their own country but still chose to fight for democracy and a chance that the situation may improve, improve with their help. Unfortunately for Lucas, the film did poorly at the box office, as well as critically. Despite Lucas's best intentions, the film was criticized for suffering from one-dimensional characters, corny dialogue, and heaps of cliches. In addition, as Holden puts it, the tone of Red Tails proudly harks back to the 1940s and 50s when good guys were good and bad guys bad. While this may be a good way to introduce audiences to this little known unit, it does not bring anything new to the war film genre. Critics lamented that the film did not focus enough on the cruel treatment that African Americans had to endure while they served their country. As a result, 
there was no real reason for any audience from across the racial spectrum to watch the film, and so no real appeal for film studios to back it financially. Therefore, while Lucas's cause was noble, it did not stand a chance. In a future lecture, we will explore these racist attitudes further in an attempt to explain how the US movie industry reflected the social inequities that America was waking up to in a post-war world. But that is for a later time. In conclusion, we have seen that archetypal images are associated with inequitable human relations in general and their roots can be traced back centuries on both sides. These images transcend race and represent formulaic expressions of the self and other. The dehumanization of the other contributed immeasurably to the psychological distancing that fostered hate, savagery in battle and atrocities by not only the US but also by Japan. The dehumanization of the other based on race affected the war effort of the US as 1.2 million African Americans faced discrimination on the basis of their race while trying to fight for their country. Hollywood's response or lack of response to depicting these men was and still remains symptomatic of systematic racism that continues to plague the United States. For so long, the good war was not only to, uh, was not only sold to millions of Americans, but also the Western world brought the idea that the US were the moral watchdog of the world. But as we have seen, the good war was constructed upon a mythology that represented the USA as the absolute good of the world. However, we, all, we have also seen that this representation has at the very best overlooked its own atrocities and at the very worst advocated for those atrocities to be perpetrated. Next time, we will look at how one of the most controversial moments in the Second World War, namely the use of atomic bombs against Japanese cities, has been represented. <laughs>